and welcome to an Around the Lens interview. My guest today is the founder of pdvid.com, and I would say alternate source for videos on the internet that isn't YouTube, uh, Mr. Craig Stadler. Hello, Craig. How are you? I'm good, David. How's it going? I'm great. I'm great. You know, it's uh, the day we're recording this, of course, is election eve or election day, I should say. And, you know, it's in the evening right now. So we'll probably know here soon what the results of that election are. Uh, I know we're right. both kind of ready to get this over with, of course, uh, as much <laughs> of the country is, I'm sure. How are you doing with everything in your life going on right now and all the world and its tumult? I'm good. Yeah, thanks for asking. Obviously, things are a bit uh, anxious for a lot of people for different reasons. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. COVID, the you know, election, all that stuff, but faring decently. So thanks. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, uh, you know, we have you on today to talk a little bit about your website, pdvid.com. And as I mentioned, it's, you know, sort of an alternate source for videos that kind of, uh, you know, uh, from my experience working with it, and also kind of how you've described it, it sort of culminates or collects like 70 different uh, sources for videos on the internet and essentially creates a, a search engine for those videos. So it, it kind of takes from every source except for YouTube. And it just, get, again, allows you to see like, hey, there's a whole world of video out there besides just YouTube, right? Because we tend to get sort of locked in our general thoughts that, you know, if you want video on the internet, you go to YouTube, right? They've sort of become ubiquitous. But again, there isn't, the, you know, there's more than just YouTube out there. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little, you know, if that if that's an accurate description of your website and kind of how it came to be, the origins of it. Sure. Yeah, that was pretty accurate, except for one thing. There are some YouTube videos in there. Okay. Uh, but largely speaking, the ratio is very, very high on the 95 percentile of everybody except for YouTube. Right. Uh, basically, the reason this came about is about two years ago. I was doing some research on closed captioning videos and whatnot and kind of realized that it happened without me even noticing that uh, the video landscape, as far as the ability to search for videos, had geared entirely toward YouTube. And, you know, I don't have anything against uh, YouTube, but uh, growing up with the Internet and the Web, uh, that kind of thing for so many years, I just saw so much variety and so many different sources to get things uh, whether it was Daily Motion or Vimeo or VO or just all these different video providers. Right. Um, and then kind of waking up one day, not paying attention for a long time, and realizing no matter what search engine I went to to search for videos, whether it was you know Google Video or Bing or Yahoo or DuckDuckGo, pretty much anywhere, was largely, if not entirely, YouTube results. And so I started doing research to find out who's still alive, what's still out there kind of thing. And then I started asking people, do you use a video search engine? And without exception, 100% of the people said, I don't use a video search engine. I just go straight to YouTube because those are the video results I get anyways. And arguably, I'm, I would imagine people listening to this would probably identify with that too. And so my idea was, you know, why not create something that gives visibility to other video platforms, whether they're ones that still exist or newer ones that people don't necessarily know about, just simply give people variety. Just a, another point of resource, so to speak. So I started doing research to find out who was still out there. Sure enough, I found out that there were a lot of providers that were still out there, like Vimeo and Vio and Dailymotion. And, you know, obviously you have Twitter videos, there's Instagram videos, there's TikTok, there's so many things out there. And so I figured it was a good idea to make a video search engine that catered highly, if not almost entirely to non-YouTube sources to give people a place to go to find those things. Uh, maybe the video doesn't exist on YouTube. Maybe it's a, a piece of personal content on a platform that they don't have a channel on YouTube, that kind of thing. So that's really where the idea came about uh, about two years ago. And uh, obviously it's grown considerably since then. The more research that I did, the more places that I found. Uh, now I believe we're at almost 600 million videos from 70-something wow. sources. Yeah. And how does that compare to what's on YouTube? Like how many videos are on YouTube? You that's know. a you know that's a really good question. I wish I did. I've looked for uh, you know any kind of reference to uh, references to that. The only thing I've been able to find are some you know very very uh, large numbers as far as like the amount of hours that are uploaded you know on a daily basis. I don't have that that figure, but they they do publish you know how much content is uploaded, but not really how many videos they have per se in their index. So right. you know it could be four times that. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, I would like to think by getting a lot of different videos from different sources, it's kind of, you know, I don't want to say exponential, but seems fairly large to be approaching, you know, over a half billion 
Videos, absolutely. but who knows? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. All I've ever heard is, you know, you always hear things like, you know, they, they get 24 hours of video every minute or something like that. You know, some <laughs> crazy astronomically right. high number. So, but, you know, when you're sort of not the only game in town, but again, the one that people have kind of come to rely on or seek out or, again, not even think of at these platforms. I'm familiar with Vimeo because I remember, you know, many years ago when I got my uh, my DSLR, my 5D Mark II, and I was shooting a 1080p video. I really wanted mm -hmm. to showcase that HD capability, HD content, and YouTube. I don't know if it was supporting HD at the time or if it was. You know, of course, YouTube likes to compress and, excuse me, YouTube likes to you know, compress and just pixelate and, you know, do all kinds of things with the video and make it just, you know, not, not garbage, but, you know, it definitely affects the quality of the video. And sure, Vimeo was great at the time because it didn't. It was it, it kept your video in the same bit rate and the same quality that you uploaded at. So I was like, okay, this is the, the platform that I want to host my stuff on. But then over time, you know, YouTube just became more and more ubiquitous and sure. I didn't even think about it. You know, so you want to create, again, a search engine that focused on all these other platforms. And when you talked about, you know, when you search for video, yeah, usually I'm on YouTube searching for a video. But sometimes I use Google search and I search in the video tab to see kind of what it brings up as well. How does your search engine differ from Google's own video search capability? Well, I would say in, in a couple of different aspects, what I've found, and this is just from my uh, research and, and testing the, the Google video mm -hmm. uh, tab, I guess is what you would say, yeah. um, is that obviously there's a high percentage of YouTube videos, and we've already addressed that. Right. The other thing that I found, too, is that it seems like before YouTube became as big as it is, pretty much the number two website on the, the entire Internet at this point, um, I think what they were doing is they were – spidering or scanning for uh, any kind of video content across web pages of any type. And that could be a video on a news outlet or something on somebody's blog or that kind of thing. I think it was looking for whether it was flash video or some type of, you know, HTML enabled video, not really by the source, but just anything that it could get. And so the, the approach that, that I've taken with PDVid is, all the sources are actually vetted, which means if I find out about a new platform that's out there, I go and look at that platform, uh, like, say, BitChute, for example, which is a, a newer, new-ish uh, video platform uh, that's a, a bit more, um, uh, I guess, liberal with the, the types of content that they allow on there as opposed to, you know, YouTube that's very strict. Um, I went and I looked at their site. They're out of the UK. Started looking at all this, you know all their stuff, make sure there wasn't anything, uh, you know, questionable in regards to like extreme violence or pornography or anything like that. And then said, okay, these guys are good. And then talked to them and decided to, you know, make them not really a partner, but you know, actually have their content in there, uh, in the, in the search engine, of PDVid. So it's it's really a matter at this point where. PD, the spiders aren't really going out there and getting anything that they can. Mm -hmm. We've targeted very, very specific platforms. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives the user a better experience because when you're out there, and this is nothing against Google or YouTube, but when you're out there just getting any video that you can, you don't necessarily know the context of that video, where it's coming from, if the page might have malware on it, you know, a lot of different things like that. And by, by vetting the sources and making sure that you trust the source, not necessarily the, the, you know, the information that's on there, but all these other, you know, very important things. It's almost ensuring a level of safety for the end user, if that makes sense. Um, and that, so I think that would be a, a pretty significant difference is the way that we get that data and the way that we uh, choose to present it to the user. So yeah, no, absolutely. You got the velvet rope, and you only let in the the vetted folks, you know, into the party, right? Kind of, yeah. I mean, there's certainly plenty of them, but yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, you've been a developer for 30 plus years, so I would assume, you know, obviously putting together your own video platform like this or aggregate platform probably takes some some know-how. You know, did you find it difficult as a, from a programming perspective to put this together or what was the most, what was the most difficult process in kind of developing this and putting it together? So um, I've been specializing as a search engine architect, which is somebody that actually works on the back end of a search engine, whether it's, you know, anything that has a search box. Like yeah. you go to Amazon, they're a search engine. Anything that has something that you can search products or e-commerce or anything, 
Um, there's a back end to that. There's an engine behind that. And that's what I've been specializing in for probably 15 years now. Wow. Um, so it was really natural for me to make another search engine because I've already been working on search engines for so long. And being a programmer uh, now, uh, it's been about 40 years, November 18th or wow. so, around that time. I started when I was about 10 years old. You know? Oh, okay. But about to be 51. So oh. uh, basically, the long story short is there were certain parts of this that ended up becoming really difficult that I didn't expect that have to do with scale. Mm -hmm. And by that, what I mean is <clears throat> creating something as a proof of concept, just as I guess you'd call it an alpha at that point, pre-beta, mm -hmm. something that just shows that it can work and it exists. So I did that in a fairly short amount of time. I want to say it was less than a month. Wow. As the platform grew more and more and more, um, it was the scaling that became more difficult because once you get into 10 million videos, 100 million videos, 200, you know, half a billion, things start to like kind of break down and become more comp complicated. Um, so the biggest problem that ended up happening, believe it or not, was storing the thumbnails. Yeah. Because if you think about it, a, a thumbnail as a JPEG, even if it's really small, right. I mean, you can't really easily store, uh, you know, 600 million JPEGs like on a single directory on a hard drive. It's yeah. just, it can't happen. The operating system isn't designed to be able to do that. and It'll break down no matter what it is. So I ended up having to figure out how to like uh, kind of store them in what's called a CDN or a content delivery network across a lot of different places or locations. So something that's as trivial as like a visual thumbnail, you'd think it'd be like a piece of cake. Why would that even be an issue? Well, the problem is, is when you get into really high numbers of these things, whether it's a database or images or anything at that point it could be an address book you know once you right. get into the billions of people you know you need to take other technical considerations into account and sometimes and especially in my case for this one sometimes you don't make the right decision the first time and, and you have to kind of backtrack and then figure out what to do that it becomes more complicated because you kind of screwed up your first decision mm -hmm. so that's what ended up happening um it's it, believe me it's nothing against amazon because i really like their you know, their, their infrastructure. But when I decided to use them, uh, their buckets and whatnot to store the images, there were complications with that. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up having to move them to another place, which was a dedicated server. And then that became complicated. And then I had to find a third one. So I ended up making three relatively significant um, learning lessons, I guess, right. <laughs> screw ups, whatever you want to call it. Um, and now I know uh, much better. And I'd like to tell the story just in case there's anyone technical listening, they might be like, yeah, okay, help anybody out. But yeah, so that was really, it was ma mainly storing the thumbnails that have to do when you get the search results so that you can actually see the thumbnail of the, the video that you're about to watch. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's all these little things we don't think about as the end user that have to right. go into how the data is served to you, you know, when you just, you know, like, I just want to see some videos of cats, right? <laughs> but no, there's right. a whole thing going on behind there, how they serve that image. So that's pretty interesting. Speaking of cats, you know, of course, PDVid has cats uh, built, you know, into the design of the website. You've got a cat right there staring at you when you, you type in your search. And then, of course, that little meow that happens when you uh, actually activate the search. And then, of course, I was looking at your Instagram page and uh, I see PD. Uh, I'm assuming that's the same cat, PD, that's all over yes. your Instagram page. It uh, is. That's that's pretty nice. You kind of giving your cat sort of their little bit of immortality on the internet. What was the inspiration for kind of you know not only naming your website after your cat but also featuring your cat so heavily? So when I came up with the idea for the search engine, I had no idea what I was going to call it. I just knew that there was something that I was you know really passionate about creating. Didn't know if anyone was even going to care at that point, but it was just something I really felt like I wanted to do. So. Came up with this. I said, I'm going to give myself a certain amount of weeks to to kind of crank this out and put it in front of some friends and see what they think of it. So I did. And in the course of doing that, I kept milling over, like, what am I going to call this thing? And it, it can't be too technical. It can't be too silly. Uh, it, it was difficult because a lot of domain names have been purchased and squatted, which means somebody buys it and then hopes somebody's going to pay them a whole bunch more money for it later on. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, so I'm milling this over and I swear it was probably like hours this one day. And finally I was like, you know what? I'm just going to give up on this. It'll just come to me whenever it's going to come to me. I just need to stop banging my head against the wall. Like people say. And, uh, sure enough, it wasn't much long after that could have even been the same day, but it was very shortly after that, 
uh, my cat, who's a ginger, orange cat, uh, came up and he was just rubbing on my leg and he's my favorite guy of my cats. And I thought to myself, you know what? I really like cartoon versions of animals. I like Felix the cat. People love cats on the internet. This is kind of fun, a little bit cute. Um, so I'm going to hire my friend who does mainly artwork for uh, like horror magazines and stuff like that to create uh, a cartoon version of my cat. And his name was Petey. Um, who was named after uh, there was a TV show in Nickelodeon called Pete and Pete, and they were both they both had red hair, and so that's kind of where the crossover the name came from. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna basically make a, a brand behind this behind my cat Pete, and sure and sure enough, I looked up his his name's Petey obviously for his nickname, so I looked up uh, Petey Vid, which is obviously short for video, and there was nothing on the entire internet, so I got really lucky. Uh, so that that's the thing you you know when you're doing research on these things you have to actually go and find out if anybody's used the name have they used the brand have they used it for another type of product that kind of thing even even if it's a band it could be anything yeah you just have to be really careful about those things and so I got lucky with that sure enough nobody had used the domain nobody had used the combination of those two words and I was like okay this is perfect uh, it's going to be modeled after him as a cat him as the mascot other brands have their mascots and why not just do that. Uh, kind of unassuming, not too technical, not too silly, right there in the middle. And then I was like, you know what? Everybody has Instagram for their pets and stuff. Why not make one for him too as well? And then he can have his own uh, Instagram too. And uh, yeah, it all worked out really well. And then I made some merch and all that kind of, you know, fun yeah. stuff. It's good. Yeah. Absolutely. He has a decent follow. Hey, more people follow PD than us. So, hey, he's got, a, <laughs> you know, he's growing there. That's great. 5,000 plus followers. Awesome. Awesome. Well, good. Good for him. I'm sure there's mm -hmm. lots of great insights and whatnot. Uh, you know, be like, you know, PD dreaming, PD thinking about cat, that m mice or whatever. So, right. That's great. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the reasons you, you mentioned that you wanted to build this website was to kind of provide an alternative uh, resource for video to YouTube. You know, YouTube, of course, is becoming ubiquitous and it grows every day and becomes, again, sort of that you don't even think about, right? It's just, hey, it's the place I go to watch video. You know, it's kind of going to that almost monopolistic status, right? You know, I mean, that's kind of what, mm -hmm. you know, Congress yes. and Senate, they're in session right now and they're interviewing these CEOs and talking about potentially, you know, bringing, well, I think they did bring up a, a I forget the exact term, but they essentially are charging you know, these, these tech companies with sort of their monopolistic behavior and they're potentially going right. to, you know, bring up, I guess, I think like a grand jury or something to potentially break them up. And so, you know, do you feel that there is an overwhelming sense of, um, you know, perhaps that YouTube is being too overhanded or, you know, too heavy handed with their curation and selection of what is and what isn't seen by the viewer? Well, I mean, there's, well, two things. The first thing I was going to mention is, to your first point, um, I think one of the things that they're arguing over is the uh, status of whether these organizations serve under a specific rule set as a publisher or an editor or that kind of thing, uh, because they are acting in certain ways about censoring and removing content, which would place them in a specific category that they don't have certain legal protections. And I think that they're trying to argue that they should maintain those legal protections. Uh, and so I think that's being kind of battled out right now too, as well. And I think that's an important thing to have happen because I, I don't, you know, pretend to know a lot about this, but I think that those rules, uh, that section was put into place quite a while ago and it may not be as relative now. So we re certainly revisiting that according to current, uh, current climate and current situations is a good idea. Um, as far as the monopolistic point, um, I'm not necessarily a fan of monopolies, but I think that we could stand to have more variety, but then there's a flip side to that in that I'm not sure the end user really wants that. I mean, I think that the end user in a certain aspect is, uh, upset with things that are going on. It's, I think they certainly don't like certain forms of bias and censorship, uh, perceived or not, or demonetization or removed content. You know that. You know those topics. They're certainly interested in those, and they're certainly upset about them. But are they ready to jump ship and go to a completely different platform? Probably not. So that makes it very, very difficult. I think because, on one hand, you know, certain end users or maybe a lot of end users uh, are complaining about this. 
but they don't necessarily want to go somewhere else either. So then that, that actually leaves that power in, you know, in, in their hands by them not wanting to necessarily jump ship. So it's almost like the monopoly is, um, wow, I don't want to say like, they have such a, such a brand loyalty at that point that it's almost like they'd have to do a lot to get it, somebody to actually leave them. Because it's like they have this mass, uh, mass market uh, and somewhat evangelical following in a way uh, that they've purposely done, which is great. But like I said, even if two or three or four other alternatives come up, it doesn't mean that people will actually want to, to engage them. You know, so I think I, I'm not sure I know how to answer your question, because what I would say is I don't like the idea of kind of just a blind monopoly happening, but I don't necessarily know how to solve that problem to give people that little push to go and engage other platforms. Yeah. And I don't yeah. think, you know, we talk about their monopoly, right. But then, you know, their argument is, well, we just create a better product, right. And, you know, it's people come there because they like the product we're giving them. And from a purely user and also creator perspective, you're right. It's like, you know, there isn't a, I see a video every other day about some YouTuber who's like, oh, complaining about the platform and how right. they're, you know, demonetizing their videos or they're hiding their videos or, you know, they're just making it more and more difficult to be a content creator on the platform, but they never mm -hmm. leave the platform. You know, they're not going out to start their own platform. <laughs> they're not going to Vimeo. They're staying on YouTube right. because they know even with all the different things that they have to deal with to, mm -hmm. you know, be in line with YouTube's guidelines and whatnot, it's still the best platform for being able to, you know, if you will have enough following, monetize your content and make a living off of it. And, you know, you're not making a living off of Vimeo unless you're, you know, part of their program where you actually charge people for your work and sell your work there. Right. Or any of these other, you know, daily motion or whatnot. I don't even know, you know, what their sure. monetization um, capabilities are or whatnot. But, you know, this isn't like YouTube back in, you know, 06, 07, right, where people were just kind of figuring things out and no one was making money on the platform. You know, it's it's a, it's a vehicle for information, sure, but it's also a huge cash cow. And, you know, it's, it's where people go to advertise and go to people where people go to watch content. Right. But, well, the other thing to, uh, to add to that is I would say that, you know, Google and YouTube did put a lot of money into the slow and steady wins the race kind of game. Right. And I think it wasn't until recently that, the, you know, the fire hoses weren't completely turned on, but I think that was completely strategic. Yeah. Um, which, which makes sense, you know, as a business, I don't hold that against them, but I, I, yeah, I'm not sure there's real any easy answer to that. And I think for anybody else to try to do the same thing would take quite a long time. And it might even be more difficult than it was for YouTube to do it in the first place at this point, because of the, the loyalty and the brand following that they've built at this point. No, absolutely. I think, yeah. think you can have anyone just like search, right? No one's going out there and creating a like a brand new search engine, except for, you know, like the last new search engine I know about was DuckDuckGo. And that's, of right. course, because, you know, it does kind of provide that same sort of thing that your your website does, which is the, you know, we're not tracking you, we're not, you know, taking your information and selling it to advertisers and whatnot. You know, we're actually just allowing you to search for what you want and get it. And, you know, that's kind of a market there, right? You know, there's a, there's a people mm -hmm. who are more savvy and don't want all their information sold to the highest bidder and are willing to use other services and platforms. Where I've seen some success with people who've gone out off YouTube is things where you pay for the, the content you receive. So things like Nebula or, or whatnot, or these smaller video platforms that are subscription-based. You know, subscription-based mm -hmm. platforms seem to have been something that is more you know, successful with regard to alternatives to YouTube. But again, those are going to be limited by the fact that they are pay platforms to you know, watch content. So, right. You know, one of the things you said you do here is obviously you, you know, you provide the content. It's uncensored, unbiased. And you also, you know, you're not tracking people's viewing habits and whatnot. From a you know, purely technical perspective, how do you do that with your platform and how do you how do you sort of manage people's expectations, right? So like let's say I want you to track my you know viewing habits and stuff and give me more curated content. Is that something that you even enable or is it always just gonna always be you know, we're not tracking you, it's it's completely uh, you know 
completely up to you to do what you want with this, the platform. Yeah. So as far as the the tracking, it's it's just that way statically. Don't save user IP addresses or search history. Uh, we do offer uh, like relative related content. Well, so if you're in a video and you're watching it inside of the page, because we do have an embedded player, you'll look on the bottom of the page and there'll be kind of a slider uh, that you can do a swipe series of images that you'll, it'll show you related videos on the bottom that you can kind of swipe left and right in relation to one that you're currently watching. And that's very much in the same vein as YouTube has theirs down the right and, you know, other platforms have other suggested videos, but it's related to the content itself. It's not really related to what you've watched previously or maybe what other users have watched in a similar manner. Um, those type of algorithms are largely based on saved user data. And since we don't save that user data, we don't really have it to be able to process it that way. So it is a little bit uh, old fashioned, but we have received, you know, some accolades and appreciation from people and the fact that, you know, we're not necessarily forcing that on, that on people based on their previous viewing habits or that the same machine or same network or other users with similar interests or that kind of thing. There are people out there in a growing body that are appreciating that kind of experience. For those people who are just going on the internet to watch a video, you know, what would you do? To, what would you say to tell them why this collection of their user data, you know, is something they should be concerned about? Like, why, why, why should I care if YouTube is tracking everything I watch? Where, where's the the negative potential for that? Well, uh, that's a really interesting question. It's difficult for me to answer that. The reason that I made the decision that I did not to include that in PDVid. Um, has to do with more so the revenue model. Not only would I not necessarily know how to, you know, monetize that user information, I think it's it should be privately held by the end user. And I think there are other ways to do that, both traditionally and kind of in a newer way. So I decided to make, make a Patreon and create a, you know, a, a, a channel that has um, on YouTube, believe it or not, that has reviews of other websites and other search engines where we have, you know, a guy that reviews other sites and things like that, just trying to think outside of the, the box on what typical monetization of a site looks like. And so rather than going with that model of trying to monetize user data and sell that to third parties or share that with other places, uh, I just decided to be a bit more creative and try to come up with new ways, you know, to, to obviously make money on the site uh, to support the infrastructure so that the keep things running and the, the user doesn't necessarily have to worry about those things. I know the one complaint I've heard from some people is they've said, you know, when I go back onto YouTube, I kind of hate the the suggestions that I'm given. Sometimes they're not really relative. They're not in the same order. I load the same page twice and my suggestions are completely different. You know, a lot of stuff like that, um, which I, that's just personal preference, I would say at this point. So it's not really a matter of anything that would be like harmful to the end user or, you know, that sort of thing. I think it's, like I said, the only thing I've heard is more so just a personal preference. Uh, yeah, I think it's funny, it, yeah. you know, because obviously my kids like to watch cartoons and other videos on YouTube and sort of you know, they love, love trucks, right? And so I'll put on something for them with my phone. And then, of course, you know, when I'm when I'm done showing them whatever the you know video is, I go back to my personal search history or my personal viewing habits. And they're like, oh, here, you, you watched a kid's video. Here's a bunch more kid's video. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> right, Just yes. messing with okay. my algorithm and my personal preferences. Right. And that's another case, too, as well. A shared machine, a shared account, shared whatever. Yeah, same thing. Absolutely. Where do you, uh, you know, obviously you've got the website, right? And so from a utility perspective, you know, I'm used to, of course, having an app for everything. Uh, do you see P video as becoming an app in the future? I do, I, but it's not necessarily in the same sense of what the website does. So um, what I picture the app doing, and we're kind of milling this over about how to do this correctly, would be if you, in a sense, had um, an app that you could load, put in a keyword list of all the things that you're interested in. It could be the elections that are going on right now. It could be a lot of different things. It could be the things that are going on um, with you know, social media being, you know, under new reins and that kind of thing, new laws, uh, anything. It could be how to make a, a cake, who knows? So you basically put this wish list into the app, you let that app run, and as our system finds new videos, it will actually do a push notification to your phone so that your phone will say, hey, there's new videos we found on Vimeo or Dailymotion or Twitter that have to do with, you know, 
Uzbekistan or uh, who knows <laughs> how to how to cook a X pie or whatever, uh, anything. Uh, but then it's not really a, an active user search experience. It's more a passive experience, which I think is more valuable and more important to like a mobile platform. Because if you have your phone, you don't necessarily know what you want when you want it. Why not put a list of what you think that you want, and then it'll come in as you fi- as it finds them for you, and then serves them to you. So that's so really what I imagine, yeah. So you'd be driving people to the native apps that have the video as opposed to being the host or, you know. Right, yes. Okay. That's pretty neat. Mm-hmm. When do you think we'll see something like that, you know, something we can download from the App Store? Is that something in the in the roadmap for the next year? Yeah, first quarter next year is what I'm thinking. Initially it was, you know, t- towards the end of this year, but things have been obviously really crazy with COVID and everything. And right pulled a lot of different directions, both personally and business and everything else. So, oh, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. Well, the one thing, you know, I guess if you're looking for silver linings, right, you know, a lot more people are inside more, they're on their computers more, they're watching video more. So, you know, there you go. There's, there's potential more eyeballs and audience for your website and your platform. Yeah. Nice. Absolutely. And the other thing to add to that, too, is I think, all the news that's been coming out about censorship and bias and that kind of thing, we right. fall right in line with that too as well because, you know, if people are concerned about uh, censorship and bias, certainly having more sources to get the information that you want is always a good thing. Um, so instead of just going to YouTube and searching one platform, you can go to ours and search 70 different platforms at the same time Right. for Absolutely. any particular topic, yeah. yeah and which you isn't know, to say YouTube's bad, but yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, I think it's it's you know in the eye of the beholder in a lot of ways, but you know obviously our president has made his dissatisfaction with you know various search engines and social media sites, you know pretty well known. Do you anticipate you know anything happening with those platforms? You know if the current administration stays the same, or if the administration changes, do you see any sort of changes you know occurring? Obviously, you know we've got this what's going on with Google and the other platforms right now. But you do, you, do you anticipate anything changing as we go forward, either if we stay in the current administration or if we go to a new administration? I'm not really sure about that. The only thing I can reference uh, has to do with the recent situation with TikTok. Um, right. And what I, what I would say is I think that there is a possibility that if things are not going so well with uh, foreign governments, that it could be very well that – that foreign government could block access to their resources from people seeking it within the United States. That's a possibility. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I haven't really seen so much of the opposite, which would be U.S. resources blocking you know, access from the outside. Not to say that it doesn't happen, but I just haven't seen much of it uh, in the press. But I'm not necessarily saying that this is going to happen, but um, something that could because certainly blocking – uh, you know, access from one country to another over the internet uh, is something we've seen previously, mm-hmm. whether it's by resource or, you know, by larger means. So, yeah, absolutely, not sure. Yeah. You know, obviously, Google started out as just a simple search engine for websites, and then it expanded to everything else in the world. You know, images, right. videos, books, everything in the world. You know, obviously, PD Video is focused solely on video right now. But do you see perhaps five, ten years down the road? expanding PD into a larger all-encompassing search engine that includes, you know, websites or, you know, photos or whatnot, other types of media? Probably not. The only thing that I've, you know, kind of toyed around with is the idea of news itself. And the, okay. because the idea of, of news, there may be some room uh, for that kind of uh, research into the, that area. As far as, you know, the thing is, is Google and, and Bing and Yahoo, the, the major players, um, do what they do so incredibly well. Yeah. I think to get into those areas, you would need to do something that's considerably different or something that has some type of value add outside what they're already doing to even get noticed. And so the only thing that I can see at this point is I have seen, uh, you know, not saying it's valid or not, but some complaints uh, from users saying that when they go to search for news, that some of the news they get, they get is, uh, some type of perceived bias on either in either, either direction. So in the same way that we're trying to do this with video, um, I think that it could be done with news as well, potentially. Um, that's really the only thing. Yeah. That's the only, re- that's the only thing I'm thinking of outside of, of the video aspect. Um, mostly because I've already seen some requests from users to do that. I've actually gotten some emails from people on LinkedIn saying you guys should make a news 
search engine it's possible but yeah that's really the only thing i've seen evidence of so yeah i, I personally think there's room for sort of a social media engine that isn't completely tied to you know like facebook where it sells all your data and keeps everything about you uh, so if there's ever a PD book that comes out, let me know. I'll definitely sign up for that. <laughs> yeah, who knows with the social media landscape? Yeah, indeed, crazy indeed. stuff. Yeah. Where do you see the future of you know these big tech companies and their you know with regard to bias and censorship and online privacy? Do you see it being you know them taking more of a stand about what kind of content appears on their platforms and being more hands on and sort of uh, you know again. Some would say heavy-handed with regard to what they choose or choose not to show. You know, could they, you know, become you know, instead of just, you know, again being these sort of flat landscaped for anyone to put anything up, but you know, again, more content arbitrators and you know, gatekeepers. You know, do you see that being sort of the future for them, or do you think there's going to be again a change based on the way that you know Congress and the Senate and you know the government? Uh, sort of treats these companies? I think that's really what's going to, to dictate all this. Uh, I mean, I, I should probably look this up. I, I think it's, is it Section 230? I don't know. I, th I, think, I, think that's what, I think that's what it's called. But basically, there's a, there's a, a very uh, strict uh, set of rules on being either an editor or a publisher or that kind of thing. And I think that's really what's going to dictate the direction that, that these social media companies are going to take if they're reined in un, under one of those specifically. Um, because I think outside of that, they're pretty much able to do whatever they kind of want to do. Right. And I think, I think to your first point, I'm not sure if it'll get worse, but I, w I will say it's going to, going to kind of be a moving target depending on whatever it is that they feel at that point in time, whatever the hot button or that kind of thing is to be able to say, okay, this now falls into uh, our terms of service that are kind of broad, but we feel that, you know, talking about, I don't know, I could make up any topic at this point, now falls in under a hate speech, for example. Right. Whereas originally, you know, you look at their terms of service, it doesn't say anything about talking about a certain president or a certain organization or that kind of thing, or using a certain word or that kind of thing. It, it, it's, it's not that I have anything against the judgment that YouTube or Google or any of these people are making, I think the problem that most people have is it's very ambiguous and it's very uh, spotty and gran not gra non granular, non specific, where they just decide that basically the algorithm decides, okay, now you get demonetized because this is, we think this is XYZ and it's not really spelled out that way in the terms of service. And I think that's a big problem with what people are having with them is saying, you guys need something more specific rather than the freedom just to be able to decide whatever you feel like deciding. And saying it, you know, belongs in these these categories. Yeah. You know, I think it's great that you provide the sort of unbiased, uncensored, you know, search of these platforms or these aggregators. You aggregate these different websites, but again, you aren't censoring the the platforms, but the platform themselves might choose to censor, right? So Vimeo sure. could say they don't want this video of you know a hate crime or a beheading or some sort of vile right. you know content. Where does the, sort of your um, stance on the actual sources you take content from, you know, if there's a, a source that's being especially heavy handed with regard to the way they moderate their content, is there, you know, perhaps you're going to look at me, maybe I don't want to take from that source because they're being biased and censored on their own right. And then that's affecting my search results. Is there any sort of calculus there when you're looking at the different search engines or search or video sites that provide you content? It, it, there is, yeah, and it's actually the opposite of what you're talking about. Um, as far as the, the the site choosing to censor certain things, I really don't have an issue with that. It's almost like if the site is too incredibly liberal, which I'm not. I know this sounds odd, but I'll go ahead and explain this. So, for example, uh, when I was adding platforms, and I came across well, obviously, Twitter has videos, Instagram has videos. You know, we know that they do their due diligence in making sure that things are clean. My main concern with PDVid is that I, I want there to be a broad appeal in the usage of the search engine and have it to be relatively, I don't want to say kid friendly, but I'll say, I'll say safe. Right. You know, kind of thing. And so in researching these platforms, I was like, okay, Twitter keeps their stuff fairly clean. And, you know, obviously Facebook videos pretty clean. YouTube does a really good job. Um, 
and but then as I started to get into resources that were outside the United States, I found that either due to their culture or other reasons, they were very, very, and I used liberal in the literal sense of the word, not right. necessarily a political one. Sure. Um, in that, in the fact that like erotica and pornography is completely fine being side by side with children's content. Wow. That kind of thing. Only in the same platform, you know, not necessarily in the same page, of course, but mm-hmm. in, on the same platform. And so when I found this one um, platform called VK, um, I don't remember how to actually uh, pronounce it, but it's in Russia. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that there were, you know, music videos, there were concerts, there were, you know, uh, child content and stuff like that. But by the same token, if you type in a pornographic term, you're going to get that too. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. So I was like, you know what? I can't really ingest all of this into our search platform. So in that aspect, that's the only time, maybe one or two other times that I had to make the decision of creating some type of filter, uh, to not have pornography. Right. Um, so I've done the best that, you know, I've been able to do so far to keep that out. And it's not because personally I have anything against pornography. It's because I think that if people want that, they know where to go to get it. Like, it's not an issue. I think so, there's a few websites on the internet that provide that right, sort of resource exactly. material. I, I don't know what they are, but I'm oh, sure right. they exist out there. There's one or two. Yeah. So that's my whole thing. It's like, you know, if people want that, they can go find it, you know, where these places cater and specialize to that kind of thing. Right. And so that's really been my uh, judgment call is more so on that level of keeping it decently uh, like I said, clean. And it's not to say that you can't find things on there that you would not, that would not be allowed on YouTube, whether it's something, I don't, I don't know, derogatory language or whatever. I don't pretend to make up what it might be, but certainly there's a huge spectrum within 70 different platforms of what they're going to allow and what they're not going to allow. And so the only thing for me is when you get into that, uh, anything that might be unsafe for, you know, someone that, that's not of a, an appropriate age to be viewing that kind of thing. Um, and I don't, I'm not necessarily saying that PDVid is hundred percent kid friendly, but we do try to do our best in, you know, filtering out those types of things. So that's really the only level of, um, if you want to call it censorship, I guess, uh, that we end up doing. So, okay. well, yeah. congrats again on half a billion right. videos. I think that's a pretty cool achievement. You know, have you seen the platform become grow and become better adopted and, you know, in terms of your internal projections, you know, where do you see the, the platform again? What's the, the rate at which you're ingesting videos and, and, and audience numbers? Are they at a level where you're happy and are they growing at a, a rate that you're happy with? I th- as far as the content, yes, because I think the initial goal was to have somewhere around that 500 million mark by the end of this year. And we're at about 600 now. So as far as the content itself, definitely very happy with that. Um, as far as the the viewership or use the user base kind of thing. It's difficult to measure because it's, it's been shifting around depending on what events are going on. Right. Sometimes, you know, for a week it'll be India and then sometimes it'll be Russia and then it switches over to Germany. Mm-hmm. The United States hasn't been really high on the list right. of users. It's, it's all been uh, anywhere outside of the United States, including Canada. So the one thing that, you know, I think that we should probably start doing soon is to try to figure out maybe why that's happening and why it is that the adoption rate or the early early adopters are coming from everywhere except for the United States. It could very well be something as simple as the, you know, the tremendous market share of, uh, you know, YouTube. Yeah. Uh, long, really, really short story. When I started this project, um, I asked a few of my friends, what do you think about this idea? And my fr- one of my friends said, well, here's the thing. If I told you that I already like YouTube, why should I use your product? What would you say? And I thought about it for a second and I said, I would say, keep using YouTube. I have no intention of trying to, you know, uh, sway someone or sell them over to like a different platform. Uh, But what I would say is if someone has any type of interest in finding out what else is out there, new platforms, you know, other types of sites that don't necessarily have the same terms of service restrictions, what have you could be a lot of different reasons. Um, that's what we would be for, or maybe just to see what else is out there as a value add to what's, you know, what YouTube's already providing. We don't want to replace them. Uh, we don't even allow people to upload videos. We're just a search engine. So, right. yeah, no, I think it's, it's great. It can be something you keep in your back pocket when you kind of get tired of YouTube or you're not finding maybe what you're looking for. You just want to see what alternate sources are out there, you know, check out PDVid and, 
see if there's maybe something you're missing. But that's great. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, Craig, thank you so much for taking time out to, to be on the show and talk about your platform and kind of where it's been. Is there anything else you'd like to add that I didn't think to ask? No, I think, you know what, there's one thing I wanted to add in, in case I wasn't didn't uh, let you know about this. We have expanded the site into a live section for live streaming and live oh, television. Great. So if you go to live.pdvid.com, that's P-E-T-E-Y-V-I-D, uh, that actually shows live streams currently being broadcast from Facebook, YouTube, and three or four other platforms plus live television. Wow, okay. So we've kind of added another section to the site. It's still videos, not as many, but it's all things that are going on right now for live right. coverage of streaming events mm -hmm. so that could be helpful too yeah yeah i know that's very popular you know especially with the gaming channels and whatnot from twitch and everything like that absolutely there, yeah. there's a whole world of live content that's being put out there i i don't uh, i used well you know we go live every week on our show of course uh, around the lens and so obviously there's a lot of utility there if you want to engage with your audience so uh, i think live is great so glad to see that there's a, another outlet for finding that kind of content that's great Absolutely, yep. All right, Craig. Well, thank you so much for taking time out to, to be on the show and talk about your platform, uh, pdvid.com. And, uh, of course, we'll put links to that in the show notes as well as uh, all the social media links and whatnot and, that you sent me. So uh, go there and find out more about you know, PD and uh, this platform and check it out. Uh, go for a little search and see if it meets your needs. And let us know in the comments uh, what you thought of this the website. All right, Pete. Awesome. I'm thank sorry. You're yeah, not Pete. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, Craig. Thank you so much again, and uh, have a great day. Absolutely. Thank you.